Well, good evening, friends and uh, fellow Bible students. This is our midweek Bible study at uh, Lancaster Church of Christ. And if you've been following along uh, for some time, we've been studying through some of the great wisdom books of the Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, it, we've titled this study, The Quest for Wisdom. And we've worked through several books now, uh, we uh, took a look at Job and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and tonight we are finishing up our brief look at the Song of Solomon. And I hope this has been a profitable study for you. And that uh, I guess what I'm, I hope most is that you, you've been encouraged to read in these books and benefit from them, that I've been able to give you maybe some tools to help you to read them. Uh, effect, effectively. So, this is about the third week we've talked about the song, the Song of Solomon. Uh, remember that the title of the book, The Song of Solomon, is a way of saying the greatest song, uh, Solomon's greatest song. However, that exactly works out uh, as far as authorship and so forth, but um, we have uh, sort of looked at the nature of the book and and um, the nature of the authorship and how to read it and so forth, that kind of thing. And one thing I did when we started uh, a few weeks back was to send those that were on our email list a, a handout that I always give when I'm teaching Song of Solomon. It's sort of a, uh, a humorous handout. And it's, it's a picture of a woman that is described in the song. I'll just show you here a little bit. And so you can sort of see that it is a bit of a, a hideous caricature. And it's based on descriptions of the woman in Song of Solomon in chapters 4 and 7. So I'm going to read through some of these verses but they're sort of randomly pulled from chapter four and seven. So these are verses where the man, uh, we think the young guy, is speaking to the woman and he's sort of praising her and talking about how, how beautiful and attractive she is. Um, but it's one of those things we sort of have to translate to our day and age because as you hear these images, they may not sound like compliments at least in the way we would think, we might use different words. Uh, we keep in mind that uh, this is from uh, the East, an Eastern culture, an ancient Eastern culture, and it is poetry. So a lot of these images really have to be translated into something we would appreciate. And the point of this, this illustration was to show if we want to take it literally, we've got a problem because the man is saying to the woman how beautiful she is and uh, the picture is hideous. Uh, so just listen to some of these words he speaks about here, her, and uh, we'll, we'll look at one of the passages later where she's, she does a similar thing for him. So he says to her, for instance, in, in chapter 4 and 7, he says, how beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful you are. Well, that, that translates, we, we can follow that. But then he says, your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Well, we might be able to appreciate that image. Eyes like doves, you know, soft, attractive, that kind of thing. And then he says, your hair is like a flock of goats. Well, that one we might have to translate. And he says, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewe lambs. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. Well, we can sort of see that. You've got beautiful red lips. And maybe even saying your lips are thin. I don't know. Uh, and then he says, your temples. So he's really describing every aspect of her, even, even her temples. Your temples are, are like a slice of pomegranate. And then he says, imagine uh, try, trying to use this on your beloved. 
Your neck. How would you describe her neck? He described it this way. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stones on which are hung a thousand shields. Well, I think what he's trying to say is, you know, you, you've got uh, uh, a, a, a powerful neck, perhaps. Maybe that wouldn't be too much of a compliment. You've got a neck that really stands out. <laughs> um, he goes on, he says, your lips, my bride. Notice he says, my bride. We talked about how we think uh, by the middle of this book that the, the guy and the gal are married. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Well, we can appreciate that. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Well, I've never been to Lebanon. Um, what I see about it on the news, modern Lebanon, it might not be such a good smell, but surely in uh, those days, Lebanon was known for its cedar trees. I love the smell of cedar. So maybe it was a compliment. Uh, your clothes smell like cedar. And then he says, your belly. He even talks about her belly. He says, your belly is like a heap of wheat. Now do with that what you will. But it was certainly meant to be a compliment in uh, this ancient time. And finally, he says, your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which faces toward Damascus. Again, probably requires some some translation and and in order to appreciate it. But this picture by by the comedian that did this um, took all those images literally and uh, in, in a way of mocking that view that you you don't understand that it's poetry. So uh, he describes her in very colorful, um, fascinating terms. And she will do the same for him, as we'll see here in a minute. Really want to just sort of tie up some loose ends in the song. Um, and then we'll be done with it for now. Uh, just some of the loose ends. There are a lot more. Um, this is poetry, so there's always going to be loose ends. But a couple other things to mention. It's interesting with an ancient book an ancient book from Israelite culture that the most dominant voice in the song by far is the woman. Uh, you don't usually find that in the Bible. But this is a different kind of book. She clearly speaks more than the man speaks in the course of the book. She often initiates the dialogue between them. So even the beginning of the book, the opening words after it says the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, it's her that is speaking, uh, and she says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 2. And she just says a lot more than he does in the dialogue of the book. And then there's another group of, of women, likely very young women. Probably uh, the woman in Song of Solomon is young. I don't know what age, but very young. And then she has some attendants, we might say, uh, with her who are even younger. And they're referred to as the daughters of Jerusalem. And they play a role uh, throughout the book. They, they pop up uh, multiple times. For instance, in chapter 1, in verses uh, 4, and really in, in, uh, in verse 4, they say to her, we will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love her, love you. That's these attendants, these, these young uh, women um, who are around her, who surround her. And they seem, again, to be younger and a bit more naive about the topic, which is love. Um, and she seems to be sort of teaching them and instructing them about these things as she's uh, in this uh, relationship and, and either married or getting married, that kind of thing. Um, she instructs these younger women, the daughters of Jerusalem, 
For instance, in chapter 2, verse 7, we noted this uh, in our last study, how there's this thing she keeps saying to them. Uh, she says, I adjure you, uh, that, that is, I admonish you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. She'll say this chapter 2, in chapter 3, and in chapter 8. Um, this sort of instruction that don't uh, rush into such a relationship. Don't commit yourself um, in this way too soon until the right time comes. When she says, until it pleases, it seems that she's saying, wait for the right time, the right person. And then uh, they also seem to serve these daughters of Jerusalem as a sounding board for this woman. So in chapter 5, for instance, we have this passage where she is, the woman is going to praise the guy, um, sort of like we saw with the illustration, the picture where he praised her. Okay, so in chapter 5, verse 9, uh, these daughters of Jerusalem speak up and they say, they say to her, uh, what is your beloved more than another beloved, O most beautiful among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you thus adjure us or admonish us? Um, in effect, asking her, why is he so special? And, uh, you know, tell us what's so great about this. And she goes on and does it. So here's the way she describes him. Again, similar language to we saw uh, how he described her, but uh, maybe a little bit easier to understand. So in verse 10, this is chapter five again, she says, my beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold. His locks are wavy black as a raven. So far we can sort of fo follow the picture she's painting. Uh, she says, his eyes are like doves beside streams of water. Remember he had said a, almost the exact same thing about her. She says, his eyes are like doves bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet smelling herbs, his lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with jewels. His body is polished ivory bedecked with sapphires. She's sort of describing, you know, he's big and strong. His legs, verse 15, are alabaster columns set on bases of gold. He's as impressive as a powerful statue. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Remember, they had kicked this off by asking her, what's so special about him? And she tells them. Uh, so this is typical of the language of the song. Uh, so we have... Uh, the woman speaking a lot. We have this other group of young girls, likely the daughters of Jerusalem that play a role. And then there's one other group that we haven't mentioned yet, and that is the, the woman's brothers. Uh, they also play a part in the song. So they, they pop up first in the first chapter. Um, it's in something she says in verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5, she says of herself, I am very dark, but lovely. Now notice, this is a place, just to pause for a moment and comment, where their picture of a beauty and attractiveness is different than ours. So this is an ancient time. Uh, this girl is dark. I think she's probably referring to the fact that She's been in the sun, um, not talking about skin pigment so much as she's been 
out in the sun and so her skin is dark. She's, she's tan, okay, we would say. And in our culture, that is considered usually attractive. Not so much in the ancient world. Because in the ancient world, that was a sign that you were a common laborer. You spent a lot of time out in the sun. The attractive uh, caricature in that world was a very fair skin, showing that you're probably wealthy and someone else does your labor, that kind of thing. She says almost apologetically, I am very dark, but lovely. So yeah, I'm tan, but I'm still good looking. Uh, very dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Dark. She's emphasizing the darkness of her skin, her complexion. She says again in verse 6, Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. And then we get to her, her brothers. She says, My mother's sons, that is her, her brothers, were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. And she says, tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? So there's a mention there of these uh, brothers of the woman in chapter one. And then they come back in chapter eight in an interesting couple of verses where they speak. So uh, chapter eight, verses eight and nine. This is a group of another, another group of people, not the, the daughters, but we think the sons or the, uh, the brothers of the woman. And they say something that sounds a little strange at first, uh, begins in verse eight. We have a little sister and she has no breasts. Uh, I think they're emphasizing the fact that she's young, okay? And she's not fully developed yet. We have a little sister. Um, what shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? So they're recognizing this relationship that is developed. And they say in verse 9, If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. I think if you read between the lines of those words, they're saying we're going to protect her. One way or the other, we are going to offer her strength and protection, maybe a little overprotective even uh, in the way things develop. And she responds to that in verse 10 and following. But this just sort of gives us the um, picture of the different characters and groups involved uh, in this song, in this poem. And you can sort of follow then uh, the different parts that come through. In thinking about um, the, the meaning and, the, and the, the force of the song, it's been suggested that, that the song fights against two concepts. Um, one is, and we mentioned it before, but Remember this term, asceticism. Uh, the idea that, that anything connected to the flesh, like sexuality, uh, physical things, anything connected to that is inherently evil. And clearly the song uh, rejects that. Because um, while the, the song is very physical, uh, it's... it's um, uh, erotic, we might say, in some ways, not in any dirty way. That's the point. It's, it's sort of a celebration of their attraction for one another and so forth. Um, it is rejecting the idea that there's anything wrong going on. Okay, And that developed over time, uh, even in, in the ancient church, this idea that there was something naughty about a uh, husband and wife and, and, and their sexual relationship. Um, there's no support for that in the song, clearly. So it rejects and speaks against that concept. Another one, it's sort of the other side of the coin, 
that the song fights against is the idea of of lust. The idea that says that, that sex is everything. You know, um, somebody said this little quote, if the church sees sex a taboo, our culture treats it as an idol. Okay, now, the song does something different. Uh, it teaches us that the true uh, desire and, and sexuality is a good gift. It is uh, something wonderful and, a, and ultimately a gift from God, but it's not everything. Um, this kind of desire is not everything. And there are other things that are important as well. So a couple of extremes, I guess, that this song uh, speaks against. I want to highlight just a couple of more important verses in the song um, that maybe we've made reference to, but I uh, want to underline them again. So in chapter 6, verse 3, is one of the most famous verses from the psalm. And um, one, if, if you've ever seen a, a verse sort of on a poster or maybe even a t-shirt or jewelry, or in more mo recent years, uh, if you see a part of the Song of Solomon that someone has tattooed on their body, uh, then it's likely this verse. Chapter 6, verse 3, and the first part of, of that verse says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. That is um, the woman speaking to the man. And she makes this statement, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And it really is a, a thematic verse in the song because remember we talked about the importance of commitment uh, in this song, uh, the importance of uh, mutuality, and equality in their relationship and uh, the idea that, that this is an exclusive relationship. Uh, they're just about one another and no one else. Uh, they're totally devoted to one another. And so this phrase in chapter 6, verse 3, the first half of it, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Uh, in Hebrew, ani ladodi vadodi li is, is how it's uh, expressed in Hebrew. That is uh, uh, a good summary verse for the content of the Song of Solomon. And it just sort of in a short way um, communicates the message of the book. In the last chapter, chapter 8, there is another verse that is important to spend a moment on. Um, it has been said often that the Song of Solomon is one of the books in the Bible that does not mention God. And uh, it's certainly true that it doesn't mention God much. It's possibly true it never mentions God. I tend to think it mentions him in this one verse, chapter 8, verse 6. Um, and I think a real strong argument can be made that it mentions him here. In fact, the... Uh, the English Standard Version translation that I'm reading from made the decision to put uh, God, the reference to God in their translation. I think they're right in doing so. So the verse says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy is as fierce as the grave, its flashes are flashes of fire. The very flame of the Lord is the way the ESV translates that verse. Now, some other translations will say, instead of the very flame of the Lord, it will say um, a very great flame, okay? But the word that is there is a shortened form of Yahweh, sometimes mistranslated Jehovah, but Yahweh. And so we, 
It's just the Yah part of Yahweh, where it says a flame of Yah, a Yah flame, a Yahweh flame, translated in English, the flame of the Lord. Some say, no, it's not really meaning to refer to the Lord. It's just a way of saying, it's, it's used as an adjective. This is a great flame. Uh, I think they're wrong. I think um, pretty clear to me that it's a ref- it's the one reference reference in the book to Yahweh, uh, the Lord, in all capital letters. You'll notice if you have the ESV. Uh, and and what it's saying, you know, what it's saying then is that that this song about human love is related to Yahweh. It's related to the Lord. And it tells us something about God. You know, this, this, it's almost in summary at the end of the book, you know, you've, you've witnessed these two express their love and admiration and adoration and desire for one another. And that is great. And it's really something from the Lord. It's a way of saying at the end, this is a gift of God. And I think that's a great way for the book to end. And I think that's the way it ends. And it sort of reminded me of a New Testament text. I thought it would be good for us to conclude um, in that light in tying these Old Testament passages to the New Testament. Because the New Testament, although it's not in, in context uh, talking about the relationship of a man and a woman in First John chapter 4. It is talking about the Lord. Um, it's talking about God and what he is like. So in First John 4, verses 7 and 8, it says there, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. And then here it is, because God is love. And it's just one of those places where where God is defined in a way. God equals love. God is love. And the gift of love he gives us in relationships with one another is you know, part of his nature and including this kind of relationship that is extolled in the great song of Solomon. So in, in, in that light, I hope you will um, read Song of Solomon and appreciate it. Um, encourage couples perhaps to read it to one another. You might get some giggles, some of the uh, descriptions of, of one another that are used, but it might be profitable study to, to look up what did the Tower of Lebanon look like and, and why was that an appropriate way to praise one another? But more importantly, just the power of the love the two shared and how that ultimately is a gift from the Lord. So this concludes our, our look at these books, our uh, quest for wisdom Thank you for being a part of it and tuning in when you've been able to. Um, We're going to start something different next week uh, altogether. I'm not even sure what, but uh, there are a lot of options, aren't there? I invite you to to, uh, watch for the study that will be uh, posted next time. But may God bless you this evening and uh, may God's word continue to be a rich source of wisdom and encouragement to you and to your family. Take care.